Uh, if you're watching the show on Monday or on social media throughout the course of the week, or even watching Fox News yesterday because they used part of our clip from the show Monday, which is awesome to see. Um, on Monday, the San Jose State University women's volleyball co-captain, Brooke Slusser, was on the show. We got into how her volleyball team has been making headlines pretty much all season long, but really not for the right reasons. It's because it was discovered that one of her teammates, Blair Fleming, is actually transgender. Isn't it crazy that you are on a team with someone and you don't even know that they're a biological man? That just still blows my mind. And even looking, look at these pictures. I mean, let's be honest. If you were on the team with this person, would you know that they were a biological man? I wouldn't. I mean, honestly, this is an attractive girl in my opinion, which that is crazy um, that they have been able to, I, listen, I don't know what type of surgeries you have to go through. I don't know what it type of hormones, but this to me looks like a woman. So I would be just as bamboozled if I was on the team, just like these players were. Now, ever since it was made public that this athlete, uh, Blair Fleming, uh, is transgender, four schools have forfeited matches against SJSU. That's Boise State, Southern Utah, Wyoming, and Utah State. But now here's the update. That list just got longer because as of this week, the University of Nevada, Reno, has also backed out of their game against SJSU because they found out there's a transgender player on their team. The women's volleyball team released a statement Monday announcing their intention to no longer play this match, which was supposed to take place on October 26th, citing concerns over safety and discrimination against biological women by featuring Fleming, the transgender athlete who obviously holds physical advantages over female competitors. Now, Slusser, who has already joined the icons in the lawsuit against the NCAA in their quest to save women's sports, was very quick to weigh in when the University of Nevada, Reno, made this decision. She praised the women of UNR for not just making a statement about their intention to back out, but also openly citing their concerns, because Slusser understands. Here's what she had to say, quote, Round of applause to the girls of at Nevada Wolf Pack volleyball team deciding to go against what the school was forcing on you as young women and taking a stand for what you believe in takes courage. Another great step in the right direction for women's sports. And obviously no one understands better than Brooke Slusser what it means to take a stand for what you believe in and to have that courage because Brooke Slusser is certainly in that same camp. Now, it's not surprising Slusser would say these exact words, like I just mentioned. She has a whole lot of courage herself, being able to do what she's doing, speak out against her teammate, who's transgender, joining the icons in their quest to save women's sports. And earlier this week, when she was on the show and I spoke to her, she said that if she was on another team, she would also understand the need to back out and also just being on her team as much as she wants to play as much volleyball as she can this season because those games are limited. She understands why any team would want to back out at this point. Listen to what she said exactly. You have several teams, four teams already up to this point that have forfeited games against you. I don't know if more will come as a result of this latest incident or uh, once, you know, more teams are made aware that you have a transgender player on your team. But what's your reaction when a team forfeits? Yeah, I mean, I think there's obviously a part of me that it's just sad because there's only so many volleyball games you get in your career. But then yeah, on the other exactly. hand, on the other hand, it's I would be doing the exact same thing. You know, so I fully support every school that is deciding to find the courage, take the stand to not play against us. Because those are the steps in the right direction of women standing up and finding that courage to say, no, this isn't okay. Now, obviously, Slusser makes all the sense in the world. We don't need anyone to interpret why she's saying what she's saying. But unfortunately, UNR, the team that just forfeited their game, which was supposed to take place on October 26th, the school itself is not in support of the volleyball player's decision to forfeit their game against SJSU, despite knowing this would mean that their female athletes would have to play against a biological man. The school, after hearing about the forfeiture, they put out this statement through a spokesperson saying, quote, the player's decision does not represent the position of the university. The university and its athletic programs are governed by the Nevada Constitution and Nevada law, which strictly protect equality of rights 
under the law. And that equality of rights shall not be denied or abridged by the state or any of its subdivisions or account of race, color, creed, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, disability, age, ancestry, or national origin. I mean, wow, to say that all of these different classes are protected, fantastic, but protecting the equality of rights under the law, doesn't that also mean that women should be protected as well? Biological women, might I add? Uh, it's just very interesting that this, this school itself, UNR, is putting more stock in one Literally one transgender athlete's feelings rather than recognizing the feelings of their entire women's volleyball team. And maybe this isn't just their women's volleyball team. Maybe there are other athletic sports teams who encourage the volleyball team to not play. Maybe they also understand the risk that um, that is involved when you go and play against a transgender athlete. Let's not forget that Brooke Slusser, even before. Okay, so actually, let's just revisit what we spoke about on the show on Monday we revealed that there was a opposing player that played SJSU recently. And she got completely smacked in the face by a volleyball that was hit over the net by Blair Fleming, the transgender athlete. She's okay. From what we hear, she's, she's okay and hasn't sustained any long-term injuries, not similar to Peyton McNabb, who was a high school player in North Carolina a couple of years ago who got hit in the face by a volleyball, paralyzed on half of her body, and up to this day, still has long-term injuries. Her volleyball career is completely over. But Blair Fleming, even before that happened the other day, said that she estimated that these balls were traveling about 80 miles per hour over the net at the hands of Blair Fleming. I mean, imagine you have all of your force going, following through, hitting a volleyball. I mean, that has got to hurt. And players recognize, even the players on Blair's team, on SJSU, when they're in practice, they remind each other, make sure you stay out of the way when Blair's at the net because none of us want to get injured. So, I mean, I totally get also why UNR would want to forfeit the game. And it's disgusting that their school is not standing behind them and saying we support the biological women who play for us. We support our athletes and we are not concerned with the one feelings of the transgender athlete on an opposing team. I mean, this is horrible. Uh, something clearly needs to be done here, but it's great that people like Brooks Lesser are understanding how important this fight is, getting the courage, having the bravery, Riley Gaines included, joining the icons to sue the NCAA for not doing their part to preserve women's sports and also to preserve what Title IX was set forth to do in the very beginning. Uh, okay, let's continue this conversation, but bring in one more voice. Let's bring in the host of Don't At Me. It's Wednesday, Dan Dockich. Hello, beautiful. How are you? Am I allowed to say Hello, that without gorgeous. getting fired? I don't know. Thank you, guys. You oh, you're just, so pretty. You're so nice. I just called you gorgeous, so hopefully you don't report <laughs> me to HR either. Uh, hi, Dan. Hello, hello, how are you? Hello, hello, my doll. Okay, so what do you think about all this? I mean, there is uh, yeah. big, five teams at this point uh, who do not want to play SJSU for the most obvious reasons. They don't want to put themselves in harm's way. They don't want to play on an uneven playing field. And UNR has the audacity to come out after the fact instead of just saying either, you know what, either just keep it quiet and say nothing or say we stand behind our athletes and their decision. We trust they're making the right decision for the right reasons. They come out and say this does not represent the school as a whole. You know, Charlie, this is one of those. I'm kind of on both sides. I love what the women did. I do. I, I, And I would, if I were in a position of being the athletic director, knowing what I know, which is not a lot of uh, Nevada state law and different things regarding contracts with our conference, I would support them totally. But, you know, Charlie, one thing I've learned, uh, I had actually twice, once at Bowling Green my first year, players boycotted a practice, said they weren't going to play. And we had a meeting, and I handed out transfer papers. I said, well, you know, Bowling Green has to play a game tomorrow, and I got football players ready to go, so here's your transfer papers. Get the hell out of here. And they all... 
said, no, 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 no. And we ended up playing the game, and we won the game with my players. And then at Indiana, when I was named interim head coach, uh, they wanted Calvin Sampson to stay as the coach, so they didn't come to practice. We had a meeting. I said, look, Indiana's playing a game on Saturday at Northwestern. I don't give a damn if it's with you guys, or I don't give a damn if I got to go get football players, track runners who always have physicals and are cleared by the NCAA. Uh, it's a tough spot because the university, being a state university, has certain obligations that the players don't. They have contracts. They have to fulfill state laws. They have to do a bunch of different stuff. If it were me, I would say, good for you girls. Screw you, San uh, Jose State. I'm standing up with women. But here's the deal, Charlie. When you're involved in a university, in both schools I was at, Bowling Green and uh, Indiana, are state universities, you got a different set. You got lawyers involved. You don't want to get sued. I mean, you got to protect the school. So, God, I love what these women are doing. I do, and I hope, I hope that University of Nevada Reno stands ultimately stands with their volleyball girls. I, I hope that. But, but you know, I you, I talk about my wife a lot. She was a coach at Syracuse in Bowling Green, and she's like, Dan, I, we we talked about it last night. It's just a difficult spot for the school. Because public opinion, Charlie, is stand with these women, right? But there's a lot more to it when you are an administrator at a university. So, uh, again, I hope ultimately they stand with these women. But I can see why they're a little sheepish. You know, the old CYA, cover your ass. I think they got to look at that a little bit from a school perspective. No, I get it. I get from that perspective, you got to play the games that you committed to who knows how far in advance, but there is unfortunately the issue of there being a biological man on the opposing team, Dan. It's not just like, oh, we're, we're not just playing the game because we fear we're not going <laughs> to win know. against our same counter, you know, like, you know, we, we're just, we're just, no, Charlie, losing. Charlie, it's, I no, get it. We don't want to get hurt. Yeah. Yeah. It, <laughs> so it's, it's not like they're saying, hey, look. Hey, it's too dangerous to travel or whatever. I, I I get exactly what you're saying, and you're right. And look, hell, you and I both being on, you know, we've had Riley Gaines, and we I support 100 percent Riley and everything that that they're doing. It just, you know, some things when I see certain issues, they strike me, and I'm like, huh. And I always try to yeah. put myself in the other person's shoes. I always try to put myself in the shoes of, well. You know, San, Diego, San Jose State, that coach is like, well, I don't know what the hell to do, right? I mean, my state laws say I got to include this player. And the co and the administrator at Nevada is like, well, I don't know what the hell to do. Yeah, I don't want our girls getting spiked in the face, you know, which has already happened with San, uh, it, it, San Jose State. And there's an ob- – I don't give a damn what anybody says, Charlie. There's – there's obviously biological differences between men and women. The fact that we try to dispute that is asinine to me. I don't know. I, I do know this. You know, when you when you deal with the NCAA and you deal with universities, not the last thing they do is want to get sued. And I, I that's what I see this out of Nevada. They're I think ultimately they'll side with the women, but I think they've got to posture themselves right now to alleviate any potential lawsuits coming from the conference, coming from San Jose, coming from maybe, you know, some activists in their own state. I I think they've got a posture, position, lawyer up and figure this out from a university perspective. Yeah, it's a lot to figure out. Um, It'll be interesting to see how many more schools back out because right now there's five teams and they still have, you know, a couple months of games worth to play. So we'll see how the season transpires for SJSU, but you heard it from Brooke Slusser. She's like, if if every team decides they want to forfeit the game, as much as I want to play these games because this is my volleyball career, and Dan, you know as well as anybody else, you only get a certain amount of games, and, w- and once those are up, yeah, no question. your career's over. I mean, <clears throat> you can go on to play for fun, but... You're, you're, it's just, it's tough. Um, but she understands, and that's the reason why she joined the lawsuit. Now, Dan... Obviously, there's a lot of teams, I would say, that would want to probably, you know, go do something else, maybe not head into game day knowing that they're going to lose. The Jets, unfortunately, are in that position. Uh, they have become very accustomed to losing over the years. Even with Aaron Rodgers at the helm this season, the season is not going exactly how they wanted. But now things might be 
maybe, on the turnaround. We saw them almost get a big win on Monday Night Football. But now the receiving core of the Jets just got even more stacked because we're learning, uh, according to reports, the Jets are going to acquire Devontae Adams in what is going to be, well, they're calling it a blockbuster trade with the Raiders. Uh, but this is a big deal for Aaron Rodgers because he and Devontae Adams obviously played together in Green Bay from 2017 to 21. Adams was a pro bowler, made first team all pro twice in that period of time. Though we have seen, obviously, the decline of Devontae Adams in the couple of years he's been with the Raiders. Um, you know, he is, he is yet to be selected for a pro bowl. Uh, last year, he had 103 catches for 1,144 yards, eight touchdown catches. Um, so I don't know. You know, this season so far, 18 catches for 209 yards and a touchdown. He's not the player he used to be, but maybe neither is Aaron Rodgers. And maybe sometimes it just takes having a little bit of uh, rapport with the player and, and some familiarity to, to make that connection work again and do something special for your team. What do you think about this trade? What do you think it means for the Jets? <clears throat> Well, I think it gives hope. You know, when you're reeling, you're two and four, you just really outplayed the Buffalo Bills on Monday night. I I think it gives hope. Uh, It is fascinating to me, though, and this is a world of professional sports. So let me see if I understand this. Devontae Adams wants to get traded to the Raiders with his buddy Derek Carr. He gets traded to the Raiders. Thing doesn't work out. All of a sudden, out of the blue, Devontae Adams has a hamstring injury. Wait a second. Now he gets traded where he wants to go. Oh, that hamstring injury's gone, and he's ready to play this Sunday. Hasn't played the last couple games. Yeah, Charlie. Oh, my gosh. Uh, You know, I I don't know what to make of Devontae Adams. I always, when I hear him speak, I hear he's, you know, he sounds like a pretty smart, pretty good guy. He's working the system, but for Aaron Rodgers, it gives him a familiar wide receiver. For the city of New York, the Jets, it gives him hope. Now, remember, Charlie, it wasn't that long ago where, you know, before last season, we had to listen to everything Aaron Rodgers, everything New York Jets. It was exhausting. So, guess what? It hasn't gone well. He got hurt four get plays in the last season, and now they're two and four. But, hey, look, New York, they love the Jets. New York loves their sports. New York loves the new star. New York loves the, the hope that Devontae Adams and now Lazard is reunited. It's Peaches and Her back in the late 70s, and it feels so good. So let's see what the hell happens. Well, yeah, definitely That's we'll see good what song. happens, though I do – what what was the song? It was a good song. Reunited song? and it feel oh, reunited and it, feel so and it feels so good. Yeah, that's a good one. It is. That's I you I know swayed. what? I sing that song. I sing that song to myself every Wednesday. You know, because I get to see you and right. I get excited. I'm <laughs> brushing my teeth. I'm like yeah. reunited and it feels so oh. good. Um yeah. Okay, but what about let's 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 look at the terms for what they paid for Devonte Adams. Uh, they sound they sound fair. Uh, ESPN and NFL Network both reporting the Raiders will receive a conditional third round pick that could eventually turn into a second round draft pick for the Raiders. Fair trade. Uh, I know the Raiders at one point were asking for more. I think at one point, I think they were asking for a first round pick, if I can recall that correctly, like way at the beginning of these negotiations, and everyone was like. You are out of your mind if you think that Devontae Adams is worth a, fir- worth a first-round pick. So, at least they, they lessen the terms a little bit. Yeah, I mean, one of the things in the NFL is good players get traded for, you know, change, draft picks. And, you know, nobody really knows how draft picks are going to work out. It's a crapshoot. So, now nah, it's a good it, – look, it's a good move, and – I, you know, let's look at it from the other side. If you're the Raiders, here you go. It was a few years ago. You got John Gruden, Mike Mayock, Derek Carr. Come, you know, you think you're going to have something here last few years. You don't have nothing. And you don't have anything to show for it. And now there's talk that their stud, Max Crosby, may be wanting out too. I mean, it's, it is amazing to me, Charlie, and I'll just be quick about this, how certain teams in the NFL stay above the fray. They stay drama-free. And other teams in the NFL, like the Raiders, can't get out of their own way. And all it is is year after year after year, you hear about this function, and it's like, man, get somebody in there that can get out of their own way and get it figured out. 
You know what I keep seeing on the internet, and I don't know if they are still. What is the? Uh, is it Mark Davis? Yeah, the, one, the owner of the Raiders, Mark Davis. He's a. He's got a. He's got a look to him. We'll call it unique, Dan. Oh he's yeah, got a unique he does. Look to him. Um, I keep Charlie. See, I don't know. He, if they're still Charlie, dating. he's the only guy in America. He's the only guy in America that I don't. I don't want his hair cut. Only guy that has hair, and I don't want Mark Davis's haircut. He's the only guy. I'm just curious. Like, why does he think that that haircut was a good choice and continues <laughs> to be a good choice? I'm looking at it on my screen right now, and it's just, it looks like somebody took fingernail clippers. And we're just yeah. like, all right, here we go. Hair's out of your face. Get out there. You know what I mean? Like your mom would have done, like, if you were like, playing outside with your friends and you were getting all sweaty. She's like, get over here. And she just does it real quick and like sends you back yeah. out. And you're like, all right, whatever. Um, <laughs> there is this meme about, I don't know if he's still dating her, Dan, but he was apparently dating at one point this really like hot 26 year old. She was a smoke show. Yeah. And yeah. there was the meme that, oh, you know, when they, I don't even know if it was a meme, I, maybe just a headline. She decided she wanted to date Mark Davis because she thought he had a nice smile. And here he is with this dorky haircut and like this big grin or like like goofy grin on his face. And it's like, huh, she liked him for a smile, eh? Interesting. All right. Whatever you say, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, hey, uh, you know, Billion dollars make you smile too. So I don't know. Yeah. But, you know, you never know. Love is love, baby. Love is love. Love is love. And that would also <laughs> translate over to our next story, Dan, because Bill Belichick, he's got a little smoke show of his own on his arm. She's only 23 years old, Jordan Hudson. We've talked about her in the past. Now, here's where it gets interesting all right he's got this young hot babe they've been dating for quite a while now don't know what they talk about but they clearly find things to relate on whether they're they're speaking or not i don't know um anyways bill belichick we've seen him become a lot more active dan right we've seen him on the pat mcafee show we've seen him we saw him on monday night football with peyton and eli he's clearly finding his voice, getting more out there, getting more exposure because he has an interest in getting back into football. His days of coaching, as far as he's concerned, are not necessarily over at this point. And there are sources that are now saying Bill is in a bit of a crossroads on what he would like to do for his future as there is still a drive to coach again and break the wins record. But his life now isn't that bad. He's been enjoying doing TV and absolutely enjoying his relationship with his girlfriend, Jordan, that is blossoming into something that is going to lead to marriage. He wants to be with her all the time, but she's pushing him to see the options that we'll have for next season. So she wants to make him happy. Um, all right, Dan. So I don't know, like, what is a man to do, right? You've got the babe, you've got the opportunities potentially. But here's my question. Why can't you do both? If she's really in love with him, don't you think she'll go with him wherever he gets the coaching job? Which, by the way, looks to be like Dallas could be an option. Uh, that's one of the rumors out there is that Bill could get the call if Mike McCarthy gets fired. And I don't know. Dallas doesn't seem so bad to live in. If I'm Jordan Hudson and I'm in love with Bill Belichick, <laughs> I'd go to Dallas. Charlie, here, here's what I tell every coach, every, every coach, and from Mike Krzyzewski to whatever, when they leave coaching, I send them a note and say, congratulations, now your life can start. And it's amazing mm. how, how many coaches, myself included, look around, you think you're going to miss it, you think you got to have it. And some still do, don't get me wrong. But it's amazing how many guys have gone, wait a second, this is pretty nice. Hold on a second. I don't have to be working on Christmas or New Year's or Thanksgiving or Fourth of July or Memorial Day. Wait a second. I'll never forget my first year. I coached since the time, basically, I was 18 until uh, whatever that was. So 1980, when I was a player, I was involved in basketball until 2008. I swear to God, Charlie, I swear to you, 
that my first Thanksgiving, because in basketball, you're always with your team on Thanksgiving. You're either traveling somewhere, playing somewhere, having practice, whatever. My first Thanksgiving, I'm at my brother's house. My mom, my dad, were all there. My sister and we're all. And I go, wait a second. We can sit there all day. We eat. We watch football. We watch basketball. Wait a second. We're going to gamble. What? This is the greatest. I didn't know. I honest to God did not know that Thanksgiving could be that great or Christmas could be that great or the summer could be that great when you're not recruiting or Monday morning could be that great when you're not stressing on what happened with the players the weekend before. I swear to God, I got so many coaches, even ones that went back into coaching, doing it begrudgingly. But they're all like what Belichick is. Now, they all don't have a girl one-third of his age, but that's cool if that's your thing. But they all, I swear to God, Charlie, it's like, wait, there's a great life out here. And particularly a guy like Belichick, who's made a lot of money, you know, I mean, what does he have to do? He can do whatever he wants, and now he's being offered all kind of different opportunities to sit in front of a camera, which he likes. So I'm not surprised one second, Charlie. I'm not. I, I'm surprised that, you know, he, he's, he's, you know, with a 22-year-old or 23-year-old, a little surprised at that. Not from his standpoint. I mean, what the hell? But from her standpoint. But anyway, I, I, I'm not surprised that he's like, hmm. Now, I do expect if the Dallas Cowboys job opens up and they want him to be the coach, I, I, I would expect him to ultimately take it. But boy, oh boy, can I understand how he's like, huh, this is pretty good life because it is. Yeah, so I wonder what he's going to ultimately end up deciding to do. I wonder if it's going to have anything to do he's, with the girl. He's so or if she close. She pushes him in a direction you should keep coaching. Yeah. Charlie, he's so close to the all-time wins record of Don Shula, and he's so close, and he's such a historian. You know, it, the funny thing is people say, well, he doesn't care about that. Yeah, I got two words for you, my ass. When my boss, Bob Knight, <laughs> was within sight of Adolph Ruff's all-time uh, college basketball win record, shoot, I used to be at lunch, and he, was, he would be with Bob Hamill, the writer, you know, well, if we can win 23 this year, 25 next year, that kind of – he knew exactly. Belichick knows exactly and would love to be the all-time Where, winner. Yep. I could see that pushing him in. I don't think, I don't think a woman – or external uh, things are going to push him in. I sure. think that, you know, Belichick will will ultimately decide based on how quickly can he get to Don Shula's record and can the operation that he goes to compete for a Super Bowl. Yeah, good point. Um, I guess that, that actually is a very good point because if he is looking to capture that win record, he's not going to want to go to some team that's like in the, you know, thick of right. rebuilding that's – going to have a losing season because that would just add more years onto the amount that he's going to have to keep working. That's You're right. That is going to be a uh, massive factor uh, in where he decides to go and if he decides to return, if that, if that job becomes available. Um, a job that I would never want, Dan, never, ever, ever, I would never want to be the mayor of New York City. It is just, there's too <laughs> much going on here. All right. It is, it is a complete, well, Maybe it's because of partially the mayor uh, not doing their job correctly. But listen, Eric Adams, he just can't win. Um, for some reasons, I love that he gets the finger pointed at him. For other reasons, I understand that the corner he's been backed into. Uh, but this one, come on, let's give the guy a break. Eric Adams was wearing a hat recently. It had the Mets and the Yankees on it with an X between, right? Basically, he's supporting both teams. And he was ripped to shreds about it. With people saying New Yorkers, how do we feel about the mayor's New York Mets in New York Yankees hat? Because people obviously, you know, they want you to pick a side. You can't like both teams. But Dan, he is the mayor of New York City. If either team gets into the World Series, if either team finds success, if both teams can find success, why the hell not? Who doesn't want a Subway Series for the World Series? I want it. That's what I want. Charlie, I lived in Gary, Indiana, outside of Chicago. I was a White Sox fan because it was closer to my house, and we always had a blast going to Comiskey. And I'm a lifelong Cub fan because they were on my TV. There you go. One's in the National League, one's in the American League. I don't get that. If I lived in the city, if I was a guy about town in, in the big city, I would love to have a Subway Series because, well, hey, you guys want to go to – 
the Bronx, watch the Yankees. You guys want to go to Queens, watch the Mets. It's the World Series. Let's go. I'll, yes. I've never, un- Charlie, I have never understood anybody that tells me, and I got a lot of people growing up, and even now, you can't like the Cubs and the White Sox. I go, oh, my ass. <laughs> now, if they were in the same division, maybe not. But what are you, crazy? Charlie, if I was living the sex in the city life that you are in the big city, I'd be like, hey, yo, boy of the day, take me to the Bronx. I want to sit in the front row. Yo, boy of the day, take me to City Field. Get us a suite. I want to sit and watch the World Series. That's what I'd be doing were I to be you in the big city, lady. Boy of the day. I, you know what? If it was that easy. But I, I do live a nice life, boy Dan. Of the day. Um, I, I try not to keep I try to, to keep it to one to one man, not just uh boy of All the right. day. But All uh right. I'm I'm All living right. a nice life, you know. I got to I got a few new restaurants added to my my resume this weekend. I tried a new few places, went to a Broadway show. I mean, life is good, Dan. Life is good. Being yes. Good, listen. Yes. As many downsides as there are, I won't say as many. The really only downside to being a New Yorker, taxes uh, are homeless and illegal immigration problem because we have become a sanctuary city. Like the filth that you have to literally step over. Like today when I was walking out of the subway, Dan, like just to paint the picture, it's a, you, you've been. It's an underground subway station, similar to like other cities, you know, whatever. Get off the subway. I'm walking because the subway is connected to the Fox building. So I don't have to go outside. I just go through a tunnel then to go underground and up into the building I'm, I'm in right now. There was a homeless man with all of his stuff, which you see a lot of time, but this guy was not just sitting over to the side or against the wall. He was in the middle of where you have to walk to get into the tunnel than to go into this building. So you quite literally had to like step over this man's belongings. Oh, and by the way, he was like, I was actually admiring his positioning because I was like, wow, he must have really limber body parts because he was like, hunched over, sitting Indian style, hunched all the way over his legs with like his face essentially on his feet. And I was thinking to myself like, wow, he's he's a very flexible man. But also, I can also imagine the pain he's going to be suffering when he wakes up. It's kind of like when you wake up from a long flight and your head's been like, you know, cocked over to the side and you're like, oh, that doesn't feel good. This guy, I can't imagine, is going to wake up from his drug-induced slumber. I imagine that's what it is if he's passing out in the middle of the uh, subway. Uh, what he's going to feel like when he wakes up. But, yeah, that's that's kind of what it feels like to live in New York. But on the other hand, Dan, there's everything. There's every great restaurant, any restaurant you could ever want. The best of the best of the best. Broadway shows. You've got, like, beautiful buildings, the architecture. I mean, there's so many things to love about New York. So, yeah, I guess you take the good with the bad. Yeah, that, that is there's always is. good with the bad. By the way, I love a good Broadway show. I used to have season tickets to the auditorium in Bloomington. What show did you see? I saw Stereophonics. Have you heard of it? Oh, no, do tell. It is. Um, it just came out, I believe, in April uh, was when it debuted on Broadway. And it... Um, I think it loosely follows the story of the Eagles and the breaking up of their band. That's at least what I was told, because I don't know the background of the Eagles. But um, and then like the emergence of Stevie Nicks as a solo artist. Um, So there was like it was it was over three hour show It was very long, but it was very good. They had all of their own original music. The actors themselves were the were the vocalists, were the musicians. So it was awesome. Um, Super great. But there was like a lot of drama with the band. And as you can imagine, that's what happens when you go from struggling to not struggling to people finding their own voices to wanting to go out on their own. But Dan, it was great. And now I have other Broadway shows on my list. So I'm just going to become a Broadway gal. So yes! Have like a, little a gal about like Broadway. Like we did at the beginning of the show. Yes. We should have, we should, we should <laughs> yeah. come together um, with a, yes. a number that we do every Wednesday. Maybe that's what needs to happen. Yes, uh, a number. Yes, we need a number. That would be really good. I, you, the sound you would be hearing is computers and TVs being turned off if I'm doing a number. Uh, but no, look, 
Uh, the only problem I have with Broadway show, this is the only problem. I love going. Every time I go to New York and my wife, we go to Broadway show. I love, I do. I'm, I'm a Broadway show guy. But the seats are so close from front to back for my big, fat, six-foot-five ass that uh, <laughs> I got to beg, borrow, and steal to get a, uh, an aisle seat. But, oh, man. I've seen, I, I'm going to go, my wife and I, I swear to God, I was just telling my wife, we're going to New York, we're going to go see a show, and now Stereophonics is on the list. Yes. Yeah, it's actually the most Tony, um, Tony Award nominated Broadway show in history. Or maybe a Tony Award winning. I like it. Either It's either one. So yeah, it's, it's very, very popular right now. And they've actually extended, I think it was supposed to close at one point. I think they've now extended the... Um, the calendar twice because it has it's in such high demand. So yes, you should totally put it on your list. Come to New York, come see it. It's great. Um, I'm gonna. What else did I want to tell you, Dan? Oh, I know what I wanted to say. I just hope that you know. I, I wish mercy on whoever has to sit behind you at Broadway shows because, as you just mentioned, you are six yeah. five, and it's always yeah. for, for people like me five two. I need to hopefully just you know because you can't decide who you sit behind. Just hope that I sit behind someone short enough but I can still see over their head and enjoy the show. But sitting behind you... You know what, Charlie? It's tough. You know what I do? I, I really do. I, I crouch down. I understand that. And my head is massive. This is a size 8 head. <laughs> this is among the biggest heads in America right here. It's just... And when I was a child, you could look this up. Uh, my mother actually was afraid that I was what was called a waterhead baby. And if you look waterhead babies up, it's not great. Uh, so I swear to God, I'm very conscious of who's sitting behind me. And if somebody your size is sitting behind me, I will ask if they, <clears throat> excuse me, want to switch seats. Be and, and as long oh. as the person behind them, yeah, I, I'm very. Con I don't like. I, I don't like being a problem. I I either squints down like this or or watch the show kind of. I, I want. I I don't like being a problem I, I like having fun i like having a blast i like you know but i don't like being a problem for somebody else and i get that i honestly do i i get that 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 uh people behind me and my size and you know Damn. may have a problem yeah i do you're such a good person who i mean not that i didn't <laughs> I don't know, know about that, that. dan you just every time <laughs> i talk to you you continue to surprise me um, but I know mm. that you have a show to get to. You've got to go get prepared for Don't At Me, everybody. It hits the Outkick Network 9 a.m. every single Monday through Friday. You don't want to miss it. This guy, he's a he's a national treasure. He, he, he says what he thinks. He won't hold back. But he's also the guy that will crouch down in his seat to watch a Broadway I show will. so that he does not disturb <laughs> the person behind him. He is a man with duality, ladies and gentlemen. Dan, thank oh, you so boy. much. Oh, I love it, Charlie. Thanks for having me as always. Bye. Have a great rest of your day. I love his oh boy as he signed off. What a great way to go. Um, okay, everybody, before I let you go, we had touched upon the Dallas Cowboys earlier in the show. Maybe a landing spot for Mr. Bill Belichick. But then again, the Cowboys are not doing so hot this season. And like we just said, we know Bill is not going to want to go to a losing team because therefore it gets harder for him to add wins to his record and then attain the record that he is aiming for. And uh, then eventually maybe retire and marry his 20-year-old, 23-year-old girlfriend, right? We'll see. Uh, so anyways, the AT&T Stadium X account this past weekend, they took a photo of the stadium's interior. What their goal was is really to just portray how packed it was, right? Sold out stadium. Look who's here. We've got everybody who matters. But they did a little something interesting. And internet sleuths, they can, they can figure everything out. And, and they were quick to point this one out. Take a look at this photo. Tell me what you see that just doesn't look totally kosher. Maybe it's hard to see on your computer screen. Uh, the scoreboard, you can see the Jumbotron. You can see the players quite clearly. You can see the, the teams that are playing, but what's up with the score? Huh, interesting. Seems to have been blurred out, which would make sense uh, because the Cowboys lost that game horribly. It was a horrible, horrible embarrassment to the Dallas Cowboys. And in fact, let's also note that AT&T Stadium has deployed this same tactic 
several times before, too. So I think this is the third time that they've done this blurred scoreboard. We're on to you, AT&T Stadium. There's no getting past us. Maybe you should just start winning your games, and then you don't have to blur out the scoreboard anymore. How about that? Uh, three and three record. The Cowboys have some work to do. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching the show today. Always a pleasure to have you around. We're doing it again tomorrow. In the meantime, follow me on social media at Charlie on TV. That's it. Go have a great Thursday. We'll see you tomorrow. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. As you know, the Woke Sports Media is in shambles and OutKick is on top. So make sure you're tuning into my show, OutKick the Morning, for your fill of sports, pop culture, politics, and everything in between. For more original content, make sure you're clicking here. And also make sure you're subscribing by clicking here. Everybody, thanks for watching. Catch more later.